I will do it for you, Chalupa. That's the song that's playing in the background. That's the song that plays for all our happy gays. You are listening to That Gets My Goat. Yeah, what was the, oh, it was the the micro morts, or it was that one about risk, that thing that I mentioned. Sauce, Vsauce. Vsauce, yeah, I, I watched that. I was telling you've got to send me a link to that because oh know, you've never seen it no but you've oh. told me countless times I put the link on to the post with the show where we mentioned it right but I don't <laughs> have anything to do with that I just do the show and then it's like okay I'll trust that he posted it but yeah he showed it to the dude this dude that I work with and I'm saying you ought to check these out because these are really cool because I was just talking about the stuff that he mentioned in there again and then we just watched it. Yeah, he talks about, like, statistics of, you know, how did they work it out? I think they may have gone to a website or something where you go to the website and it will tell you when you will die based on the average of when, you know, how people your age should die and all this stuff. And it said, this is the mean or whatever. You will die on this date, 1959 or whatever. And then he goes, you know, the sad thing is... Based on the statistics, a hundred people that are watching this show today will be dead by this time next year. Oh, whoa. And, you know, we just talking about, like, it's just like, oh, that's, that's really weird to think. You're listening to That Gets My Goat. Do we want to introduce ourselves or should we just... Oh, think? shoot. We're recording, aren't we? Yeah, do you want none of this on there? Oh, that doesn't mean that's not supposed to be on there. We were talking about the ankle cast that we recorded, which is something totally different. That gets my go. Hello, everybody. Now I sound like Kermit. Hey, ho. Hey, everybody. Hey, ho. I, that's Welcome, how... everybody, to the show. I'm Big Anklevich. Yay! Yay! So you do it a little better, but you're actually not doing an impression. So, <laughs> And I'm Rashad Field. That's just how I say yay. <laughs> Speaking of Kermit, somebody on Facebook yesterday posted, and it's from like 19 friggin' 74, but this little girl with Kermit doing the alphabet song. Mm-hmm. Where she it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, Cookie Monster. And he goes, Cookie Monster's not a letter of the alphabet? Anyway, it had like an explanation of how this was totally ad libbed. The little girl just thought it was really funny to say Cookie Monster. And there was actually one moment when Henson breaks and, and stops being Kermit for a split second. And you can see it, you know, here and all that. Because he was getting fed up on the fourth or fifth time that she said Cookie Monster. And she'd giggle every single time. And so finally he says, Okay, if you want to do it with Cookie Monster, you do it. I'm out of here. And he starts to leave. And then she says, I love you. And he turns around and he's like, I love you too. And she kisses Kermit. And oh my gosh, I was bawling, dude. <laughs> I don't know who this was that posted it. If it was you, I'm sorry that it I don't wasn't remember me. you. No, no, no. Oh. Whoever, if you're listening, I'm sorry, you know, that, that I don't remember who you were. But I was bawling, man. It, and, and then I read the description and it made me want to watch it again so I could see that moment when Henson breaks uh-huh. and he stops being Kermit and he becomes. Jim Henson saying, okay, hey, I didn't sign up for this. All right, stop effing saying Cookie Monster. That's where he uses the F word. (laughs) That's where he's like, oh, come on, you fucking kid. This is horseshit. Let's get Frank in here to do this. So uh, I just, uh, I I don't know why. Oh, because you you are Kermit most of the time. Anyway, this is That Gets My Goat. And uh, I guess this is a, a totally random episode, but I, it, that's okay. Well, most of them are, unless they're movie review episodes, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's funny. One person had posted, I want to say on the forum somewhere, where he's like, yeah, I haven't done the That Gets My Goat, because it looks like your your format is just that you're complaining about things, and that kind of show doesn't really do it for me. So I, I He doesn't bothered. like negativity, I think he's And saying. I was just like, maybe I ought to tell him that that's not really what it's like. It's kind of a... Nothing. We may have started, like, that was maybe episodes one through five, but that's probably about as far as we got with that theme before it started branching out into, we just talk about whatever subject interests us, whether it be movies, sometimes it's even been books. No, it hasn't. Yes, we talked about certain writers' books. All right, if you say so. 
And it wasn't even a cisgendered white male writer either. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Do we want to talk about that? Or? No, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Sorry, okay. We're going to talk about what we started in with the uh, the theme for How this one. How insurance companies are the devil? I don't, <laughs> honey, I, I don't remember. See, we, uh, <laughs> see, okay, but let me interject. That gets my goat for me is just a show where we can get together it's an excuse for us to podcast and they're just way 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 more that gets my goats than there are dune steves because we don't have to get other people in we don't have to ask for lines and wait for lines and say oh you know what you could hear one of your children defecating in the background can you please do the lines again and then three weeks later it's like hey we really need those lines because you know you're the only oh oh you got them already well how come we don't have them you don't you didn't really record them did you okay why did you say that you already had them couldn't you just say, okay, uh, within a week, you'll have the lines to us, and then actually do it? That's why we don't have Dune Steve's. Plus, we have to find stories and all that stuff, and that's difficult. This, we can just start it recording. The fact that you and I are here means that we have a show. And I, to me, that's, I don't know, the, the weight is off. Yeah, it's nice. It's easy. It's basically our show minus a story is basically all that gets my goat is. We can do a show without having to do all the work that re is required to produce a story which is you know it's a fair amount of work having a story is really cool and i think you mentioned on one of your outcasts how you feel guilty when you don't have a story on there and i have to admit that it's more awesome i feel like there's really something to give to people when you have a story as part of the show and I can understand even some of those people where they're like, no, nah, I just like to listen to the shows that have stories, which is unfortunate because I bet a lot of them have never even tried listening to the outcast because they don't realize that it's a, it's not just like that gets my goat without Big Anklevich. But, uh, you know, whatever. Well, like we did the Michael Jackson episode of the Dune Steve recently, and that's basically a that gets my goat, <laughs> yeah, where we is. just talk about Michael Jackson. We talk so little about the story and I felt bad when I was editing it because we go on for a long, long time and we almost never talk about Munzee's story. And I, I sort of blamed myself for that because, you know, we did it. We weren't together when we did it. And I sort of let the time get away from us. And I, I looked up on Wikipedia things about Michael Jackson instead of, you know, being focused on, well, what did this super short story, you know, what did it have to say or what, what interesting points did it bring up? But yeah, that, I mean, that's what That Gets My Goat is. It's not scripted, and we just, whatever we happen to talk about is what that episode is. I, I feel bad that people don't want to listen to the show, but, I mean, that's what made our show, what made the Dune Steve different from other people's shows, was us going on and on and on, and our personalities, and making it like a radio show. Right. And the That Gets My Goat part is the radio show. Yeah, it's that's that's what that gets my goat is. It's an interesting thing us getting on and blabbing and blabbing and blabbing, just talking. Because especially that gets my goats and some of those other things where we don't really have something to pin us down, something to keep us in place. We can just talk about whatever we want because sometimes we say stuff that I don't know, maybe we shouldn't or maybe we if we thought about it, we might not mm. or something that's probably something that just has happens because of the way our show is, where we just talk about things in free form. Even with just the Dune Steve, the main show, you know, we have a story and then we talk a lot afterwards. And yeah, we, we'll say things that might be, I don't know, might be embarrassing, might be, I don't know, it's a weird thing because we're podcasting, which is, it's out there, but it's also not just going to come to you. You know what I mean? It's something you kind of have to seek out. You have to go and subscribe to it. Yeah, it's not it's... like you're just changing through the radio station. Right. And you hear something, you pause. Uh-huh. You, yeah. You don't flip through the stations and come across it. People aren't talking about it. You don't hear your friends talking about Dune Steve, and you need to see the most recent Dune Steve or listen to the most recent Dune Steve so you can be part of the conversation around the water cooler or whatever. You know, it's a niche. It's a very small niche kind of a thing. There's only a few, and and it's a worldwide available thing. But you know, tops 
I'd say there's maybe 5,000 people in the world that know about the Dune Steef when you compare that to the 5 billion or however many people there are on the world. I think it's not quite 5 billion, but I think it's more like two. So we've, what do you mean? There's there's more than 6 billion people in Is there? The world. Okay, I don't know the numbers. I was thinking it was lower. Oh, but anyways, okay. you know, when you compare that, it's it's an infinitesimal number of people that hear the show. So you feel a little liberate a little free to say whatever you want but it can come back and and bite you in the butt i suppose because it's available to whoever wants to listen to it yeah most of the time we never hear any feedback on the show at all especially that gets my go because again it's difficult well it takes work to give us feedback either to send an email or to comment on the show or to go register for the forums and and then express your pleasure or displeasure but people occasionally do. There was one just the other day for... A, it, it surprised me because it was an episode we'd done... I thought it was over a year ago. I don't know. But he didn't like... Uh, I, well, he didn't like some statement that we made or some belief that we had on there. And Yeah, it had been so long. I didn't I didn't remember. You had to remind me in what context he <laughs> he had problems with it. But, but, you know, there have been notorious episodes and episodes that people had problems with. And almost never that that gets my goats. It's always the Dune Steve show, which is the main show. What do we call that? The flagship show? <laughs> yeah, I think that was your phrase for it. You know, I used to complain, I guess, about my cousin when the Dune Steve first, when the uh, That Gets My Ghost first star- started because he wasn't a creative person and he, he wasn't an analytical person. He's just like, oh, that's cool or that sucks. You know what I mean? He never examined why. And that's no longer the case. Now he, he, he forms these opinions and, and he at least has, this is why I feel you're wrong or this is why, you know, I love Vin Diesel or whatever it is. And, <laughs> but he, I guess he listened to that Gets My Goat and he, he did not like what I said about him. And I, I didn't know what to say. I was just like, well, oh, you know, I, that was a long time ago that I said that. I, I didn't really remember that I said that. But I never for a second thought you would hear <laughs> me say that, you know, you don't form an opinion unless you hear it in a podcast and somebody tells you this is what you feel. Anyway, I, I, that was surprising. And, and it seems like you used to always be afraid that that sort of thing would happen with you. Yeah, I am I still am, to tell you the truth. It's like, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Back when I was in high school, I had a thing against swearing, cursing, which is kind of gone away now i didn't like it when people did it and i would get after them if they did it around me i didn't care what they did when they weren't around me basically but i had this girlfriend and uh one time i was just talking with her and out of the blue she dropped an f-bomb and i was like whoa and she immediately was like oh i'm sorry and i was like oh did you forget who you were talking to there for a second and she's like i suppose i did and it's like, you know how you, you wear like a mask, a certain face around this person, a different face around this person, a different face around... You put forth this persona. When you're at work, you act a certain way. And, you know, you, because you have to or whatever, you can't act the way you really are when you're at work because that wouldn't be proper and you'd get fired or something. And then when you're in, you know, this setting with your friends, you can, you know, let it hang out or whatever. But you wouldn't tell your friends about how you feel about Pride and Prejudice because they would make fun of you. Yes, I would. And so you don't talk about that when you're with your friend. That kind of thing where you have certain faces. And admittedly, and I think it's the same for you as it is for me, you have a certain face, a certain mask, a certain persona that you put on when you're podcasting that... And you say things that you would say, you know, when you're podcasting that you wouldn't say in other places. And there's a reason why I go by the name Big Anklevich on this podcast. And a lot of it has to do with work. I don't want those two things to ever come together. I don't want the person that I am on the podcast to become known to the people that I work with. Because I, you know, I've heard enough stories about people who... I don't know, on their blog, they said something about work. And then somebody from work read their blog, and then they were fired from their job because of what they said on their blog. Kind of a thing. I don't know that I've ever said anything that would get me fired, but it would, I think, 
probably change people's opinions of me, perhaps, at work, which uh, I don't, you know, need that. (laughs) It's hard enough to get by in this world without shooting yourself in the foot like that as well. So I use that so that the people that I work with can't just search me up if they ever felt, if my boss ever wanted. And that's apparently something that bosses do these days. Maybe not to their existing employees as much as to people they're hiring, but they search your name, they Google your name, they do background checks. And I suppose if they hired somebody to do a background check on me, they'd probably be able to come up with my podcast and figure out that this is me and that is me kind of a thing and link it. If somebody really tried, they'd be able to figure out who I am. But... You know, somebody randomly Googling me is probably not going to be led to the podcast, which I think is a good thing. I, 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 you know, it's you have to have that certain face, you know, that you show to the certain people to make things work. It's like they talk about white lies, you know. It's not supposed to be okay to tell lies, but it is okay to tell lies, and sometimes it's necessary. It's absolutely crucial that you tell people lies. Because if you just say the truth, you're going to hurt a lot of feelings a lot of times in this world. You know, when the woman puts on the clothes and says, do I look fat in this? You sure as hell do not say yes. You know, you might be able to somehow politically say, no, I don't, you don't look fat, but I don't think that that suits you or something like that. Find some other way to, to steer them away from that outfit. But you sure as hell don't tell her she looks fat. Because it's not going to go well. It's not going to go well for anybody. You're going to hurt her feelings. She's going to be mad at you. And then you're going to be in the doghouse and etc. etc. And I guess that's the same kind of thing as putting on the certain faces. (sighs) If somehow somebody finds you in the wrong mask somehow, it seems like it would be a bad thing. Like the people from work who you put on the one mask for... I don't know, they go to the bar with you and your friends and see you act the way you do with your friends. It could change things a lot, and not necessarily for the good. Maybe it's for the good, maybe it's not. But it definitely will change things. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's weird to think that. I Like you were talking about your cousin, I have some nephews who at one time at least, way back when we started the show... I know they said that they would listen to the show. They had listened or they they would like to listen? They had listened and they okay. listened to it on a regular basis kind of a thing, they said. Now, these nephews of mine are open-minded and, you know, they're, if somebody said, okay, you can pick one set of family members to be the ones to listen to the show, they would probably be the ones that I would pick because, you know, they would see the mask and think no that's cool i like that mask it's kind of like mardi gras like cool i don't know (laughs) they would be the people that would understand and wouldn't i don't think their opinion of me would be lowered because of hearing the show but it still made me gave me pause i guess is the right phrase for it it made me worry a little bit should do i want them to listen to it Should I tell them not to? Do I chase them away? Well, conversely, though, does that influence what you say on the show? Where you're like, normally I would make a joke right here, but on the off chance that my nephew is listening, I'm not going to make the joke. I mean, see, see, that's a, a decision that we've had to make lots of times. Just as far as like, what do we cut out of the show? What, what is okay to say, and all that stuff. And and our show is ostensibly intended to entertain people. Right. And so when you say, you know, we put on a mask, I put on a guy that tries to be funny mask Uh when we do our show. And sometimes that guy says things that are over the line, or sometimes, you know, it's just like, well, I'm going to try to be funny here. And so, you know, with any attempt at humor, there is the possibility that, you know, it won't be funny or that it will rub people the wrong way you know i did this whole i mean it was it was a rant it was whatever a big version of a rant is on my show 
I mean, it was humongous. It was the biggest thing I had ever done on the uh, on that show about comedy because somebody had said that I uh, I didn't know the difference between being offensive and being funny. I think that's what it was, and and so. I was just kind of just talking about what I find funny and what offends people. And, and, you know, I decided I was going to lay the cards on the table. This was going to be an intimate, every, all or nothing. You know, I was going to be all in and not hedge any bets. And, you know, what I mean, it's like a confessional. That's what it was. It wasn't a rant. Uh-huh. It was a confessional. And, I mean, I, I haven't heard a lot of feedback on that show <laughs> But one crazy thing that I did here was my uncle somehow listened to that show. And in that show, I talk about how my uncle could get away with murder and he was the least reverent guy I knew. And I, I don't know if I said it on the show or if we just talked about it afterward. Uh, but he, he heard this and he, he was upset by it that I could say those things. You know, it's like, well, hey, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm the, the, the least reverent person you know. I mean, come on. And I wanted to say, hey, dude, you, you grabbed my ass during the Thanksgiving prayer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thanking for the food or whatever. I mean, it's like, what, what is the definition of irreverent then? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. You know, he, he, he didn't, like, the same as my cousin, he didn't appreciate that. He said something about, I guess I, I, talked about you know my dad being a bigot or closed-minded or humorless or an a-hole or whatever in that and he's like your dad's a really good guy man you know it's just like you you shouldn't feel this you're you're dead and suddenly i'm like oh crap you know i somebody i know you know in that the somebody saw me with my mask off right right and with the other mask on with the other mask on but that guy that did that podcast comedy is hard that's me. That was me without a mask on. Okay. You know what I mean? That uh-huh. I didn't feel like the need to dissemble at all. It was who I am. It was a journal entry or whatever that I chose to podcast and be as intimate as possible. And, and yeah, on my Rish Outcasts, sometimes I do just ramble and I do start to say like really private stuff because I forget you're not in the room. You know what I mean? I'm alone and I forget that somebody may hear this. And you know, there's probably been a couple of things where I've, I've edited them, edited the, I have cut them out. <laughs> but for the most part, it's in there. And like the one I recorded today, I talked about, and you've heard this story, but I talked about the girl who wrote me the letter that I didn't read until graduation. I didn't know that I had this letter until she asked me, you never said anything about the letter. And I said, what, what letter? And then she's like, oh, you need to check your inbox. And I guess three months before she'd written this letter to me about going after what you want in life and, and, and that, you know, that I have all this potential and this talent and, you know, I don't, I need to stop being an effing coward kind of basically is what it was. And, and yeah, I don't tell that story to a lot of people, but I told it on the podcast and about halfway through, I was just like, oh. Is this too much? Is this, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, what am I doing? Be crap. Now I'm halfway through and I have to finish. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you do the ankle cast and you did the ankle cast before I ever did the Rish Outcast, which is, I mean, the whole name is just a play on your ankle cast. I think those two names are awesome, by the way. I was just thinking about that. The fact that we could take a cast. And make it work with our names so awesomely. That's just cool. Sorry, go on. <laughs> but, I, I, you know, if the Dune Steef is our flagship and then, you know, that gets my goat is, you know, a ship of the line. I don't know. Well, the, the ones that we do by ourselves, those are the submarines or those are, you know, the spy vessels or whatever it is. I mean, it's just I don't expect everybody to listen to the Rish Outcast. I only expect the people who are who really get me or really like my sense of humor or the, like the sound of my voice to listen to it. You know what I mean? It's like the Gino Morettos are going to listen to the Rich Outcast, and and the unworthy are not going to listen to it. You just did that thing where you said Gino Morettos. Oh, and you know there was we more than one of them. We did an episode did about that. You hate that, that. <laughs> and I find I do it a lot. Yeah. 
I don't, so I, but, but because everybody does it yeah. now, it's just become a part of the vernacular, the, you know, the Bill Nye's of the world, the, the <laughs> Tyson, what's his name? The Neil deGrasse, Tyson deGrasse junior highs of the world <laughs> do the, uh, but yeah, I don't know if there needs to be a line, a line where it's like, okay, you shall not cross whether it's language or whether it's certain topics that we're not going to talk about or whatever. But like Tom Tancredi sent me this list of questions and you already know about this, right? I do. He sent me a 20 question list that contains 400 questions. And they're not just, you know, Hey, what's your favorite ghostbuster? They're like questions, like deep, deeper questions about, you know, where my name came from and what my greatest regret is and, boners and stuff like that and i i <laughs> how many boners do you get each day yeah the guy I mean, that was question 18 but are they I, all the same size or are some more <laughs> flaccid than others <laughs> i don't know why he asked these questions <laughs> but because he took the time to ask these questions i felt like okay i'm gonna give him the answers that these questions deserve and uh, you know where i'm going with this you and i are friends because of this you and I were hundreds of miles apart, and the only way we stayed in touch was through emails. And instead of just like, hey, how are you doing, man? You have a good weekend. It was like big, long. This is the thing that bugs me about my wife, emails. <laughs> and because I was like, oh, well, this guy cares enough to actually talk about something instead of just, you know, something that you, something that someday some guy's going to invent Twitter and Someday you're going to be able to fit this in a tweet message because he's not doing that. I know that this guy really cares. And so I would send really gargantuan responses back. And so I felt like, well, I'm going to do that with Tom Tancredi. And I don't know if that was a mistake or not, but they, the, the response was so massive that I was like, well, I'm going to do this as a rich outcast so that everybody can find out about me. And yeah, I, I don't know if that was a mistake or not because <laughs> the boner one <laughs> who who might be listening? And it's like, oh, you know, three boners in a day doesn't seem like a lot. Or three boners in a day? What the heck? This guy needs electroshock therapy. When we started the podcast, it was 2008, right? Yeah. Which means my oldest child was eight years old at the time. And now he's 41. He's 41 now. But yeah, so obviously at the time that we started it, when he was eight, it wasn't his thing. He wasn't interested. None of my kids were interested. I forced my wife to voice characters when we first started, but it wasn't her thing either. She didn't really like doing... When I say I forced her, it, it really was forced. It was like me standing over her with a broken broom handle, <laughs> whacking her if she, you know, talked back to me. So I think as soon as she was given the opportunity to walk away, she was really glad to do it. She doesn't like listening to audio books, so I don't expect her to ever listen to the show. And so I probably have said a lot of things that maybe I shouldn't have said because I expect that she'll never listen to the show. I'm to the point where I don't want her to ever listen to the show because I'm sure it will bite me in the rear end. I will say rear end just in case she ever listens to the show and hears some of the things that I regularly say. There are a lot of times, and I know you have disapproved mightily when I take something and I think, eh, I'm going to cut that little bit out after you've gone through and done your edit, then I go through and like snip maybe a tiny little thing here and there. And you're just like, why the hell did Big cut that out? What a piece of crap. He sucks. Keep going. Um, <laughs> you're on a roll. And I'll, I'll do that. Basically, I'm not sometimes, basically it's just a CYA thing. You know, I'm trying to cover my butt because Maybe it's somebody out there. Maybe uh, somebody will be offended that I don't know, which is much more likely, obviously, since mostly it's people I don't know that listen to the show. Or maybe, you know, someday somebody that I do know will listen to the show. And if that happens, 
it's all the more likely that they will be offended by by something like that. So sometimes I would cut things like that out. You know, when I talk about my, my kids, they don't listen to the show, but they're not eight or six or four anymore. My oldest son is now turning 15. And, hell, he's going to start driving a car this year. Pretty soon he'll be completely out of my control. He will be on his own. He will be able to do whatever he wants. Most likely, listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine won't be high on those priorities. <laughs> maybe for a long... Maybe not until I'm dead will he ever consider, Hey, you know, I've never listened to that podcast, but maybe that would make me understand what my dad was like. And what drove him to suicide? Yeah, but there may come a time that my kids say, hey, you know, I should listen to that. I should check that out. That might be interesting to, to hear my dad's podcast. And that thought makes me a little nervous. There may come a day when suddenly my kids come to me with some questions. And the worst part is I won't remember saying whatever it was I said that was 15 years ago or eight, seven, whatever, years ago, you know? It's be like, oh, uh, it was Rish's fault. He told me to say that. That'll probably, I'll probably have to just keep saying that over and over again, which, you know, I'm definitely going to throw Rish under the bus when it comes to anything to save my hide. Unfortunately, I just recorded that onto this podcast, so now I'm screwed. That excuse isn't going to work because they'll hear this one and know that it's a lie. <laughs> Yeah, but this is years after the episode that he heard that offended him. Where you uh, say, boobies are neat. So, yeah, I don't know. It makes me, it does make me a little worried that someday somebody will finally say, you know, maybe I should listen to that show and learn a little more about Big Anklevich. Well, okay, let's, let's, let's segue for a Let's see what he's second. like with that mask on, because I've never seen that mask. Like, Ooh, it's Mardi Gras. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> And see, and I've got the, the jester mask on. <laughs> it's got the pointy cat's eye kind of things going on with it. Cool. But see, uh, if we can segue into our writing uh -huh. here, though, uh, ah, geez, just to have to censor yourself or hold yourself back or, or imagine who might, what might someone think, it seems like that's got to stifle your creativity. That's got to put... Well, chains on your muse or a straight jacket on her or, you know, an, one an of those, iron maiden at this point. And one of those uh, Hannibal Lecter masks and, there you and, go. Yeah. and the whole, and where they have to wheel them in on the hand cart. That's right. Love that's what your, your shoes. That's what your muse and looks like. I, I, that's how I feel. I, there have been times when I've really censored myself or pulled my punches or done whatever because, I don't know, my mom might read it or because what well, might someone think of me but i don't anymore it, it's i it is oh i hate people that say it is what it is but the story is what it wants to be <laughs> do you know what i mean it's like that i, I hate people that say it is what it wants to be uh, nobody says that you I asshole really like people that say it is what it is <laughs> the story wants to be you know a story for adults or the story wants to be gory or the story wants to be about butts you know and so i i don't know it's just, I, I i respect writers and the, the the written word enough to be like okay you know what only grown-ups need read this i don't know it's like abby hilton would say on her cowrie catchers you know this is a what was it this is a story for grown-ups you would find it in the adult section of the library and you know okay when right you say next it to debbie does Dallas. when you say it that way it sounds condescending as hell and when abby says it it sounds condescending as hell but she's right this is a warning hey this is a story for grown-ups and if you're not a grown-up, you know, it's just like she's saying it to a five-year-old. <laughs> if you think you might get offended, Tommy, then you probably will. And, well, and she also, is totally right. Yeah, there and, are people who choose to get offended. There are people who choose to get upset. There are people who are like, oh, my, I saw Big Anklevich over there in that How to Be a Good Husband seminar, and yet here he used the word shit. He is not a good... And you're just like, what does it have to do with anything? It wasn't him that said shit. It was a character that he wrote that said shit. Sorry. In, in Abby's defense, 
Oh, no, I was defending Abby. No, I'm just saying okay. her previous book was for children. And then she wrote this book set in the same world, but not for children. Oh, okay. So That's a good point. she does have to give them a little... That's uh, a good point. Uh, a little, you know, warning. But, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. And it's, oh, it's so hard to deal with that. You know, um, one of my favorite books growing up was Ender's Game. Yeah, yeah, I think we've talked about Ender's Game Ender's a bunch Game of times. Ender's Game was written by Orson Scott Card. Orson Scott Card is a Mormon. Mormons have a lot of certain standards, and I've heard and I've, I've read stuff where Orson Scott Card talks about that exact thing, how people look at him differently because he writes stories about people. People, all people are different. All people will do different things. Some people will say shit. And you will find that in Orson Scott Card's books. A person that says shit. And I think he doesn't believe in using that word himself because he's a Mormon, I'm pretty sure. But to be an honest writer, and I've I've seen, I want to say articles or whatever you want to call it in, in a writing magazine or something like that where he talks about how you just have to be true to your characters and you have to be true to your story and you have to tell the story. You can't pull your punches because what would... And Gladys. And Gladys, what would my uh, sister say? What would the person at church say if they read this story? And I, I'm willing to bet that he probably has a lot of trouble when he goes to church of people just looking down on him because of this dirty guy said this dirty thing in his dirty book well see he can't win though because somebody who's not a religious guy says orson's got cards a religious nut job all he thinks about is jesus and virgin mary and 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 sacagawea who shouldn't even be part of the trinity and you know what i mean so he can't win because the religious guys go hey this guy's not religious enough this guy's like a normal dirty person and the dirt, normal dirty per- people say this he's guy is all religious yeah he's... and if he didn't have his characters be themselves no one would read his stuff they'd read it and be like this sucks this guy is not acting like a real person and they would put it down and walk away and I have to admit, I've run into that in my own life. I remember, and this goes way back. In high school, we had to write a story for a creative writing class that I had. And mostly, I didn't do any writing for this creative writing class. It was one of those classes. <laughs> yeah, it's... It, it, or were in, you a jock and you're just like, I got a name. No, it was what. just one of those classes. In the TV show Community... They always have an episode, like every year, where Jeff Winger tries to come up with the ultimate blow-off The blow-off class, class. yeah. And, you know, I think the first year it was like pottery. And then, uh, you know, he keeps having these classes that are just like, you know, it's supposed to be so easy that you don't have to do anything and you just get automatic college credit for it. And so basically that's what this creative writing class was. Some days our teacher would be like, write a story about this. And what would happen was everybody would turn and start talking to their friends. And that's how the rest of the class went. A very few people might actually write something. Other times, the teacher would just tell us stories about what it was like in Vietnam or just something. He'd just sit there and talk about stuff. The whole It was not like I'm talking about writing and how to be a writer or anything. We're, I remember him telling a story about what it was like to go to the bathroom in the porta potties or whatever and you know stuff happening you see a tracer fire going across the sky in the middle of the night and and there's the animals that you would have to deal with it just weird i mean there were cool stories but it wasn't creative writing and that's what this class was no so this was the ultimate blow-off class so it was it was the ultimate blow-off class and there was very little uh actual writing done but i think i may have written Two or three stories the whole time we were in this class. And one of them, I want to say it was like you were supposed to write a story about, maybe it had something to do with cutting class. I can't remember what it was. But anyways, he gave us a prompt, and I actually wrote something with it. And uh, I remember there was a point in the story where my character, which was me, was out somewhere and then somebody crashes into his car 
not when he was in it. He was actually out of the car. And maybe, I think he was headed toward it to get into it and get back. And uh, then somebody crashes into his car and it explodes. And he goes, oh, shh. And then it just went dot, dot, dot. Didn't even actually finish saying the phrase. Well, somehow, my dad happened to walk past, was standing over my shoulder, was nearby or something when I was working on this story. And he saw that little shh, dot, dot, dot. And he looked at it, and he, and he said, big. He probably, he didn't actually say big, because as you I've were little said, in those days. And he said something else, which I'm not going to divulge here, so that mask doesn't come off and people at my work find out my real name. Anyways, he said to me, I don't want you to write stories like that. And that was really upsetting to me for some reason. But that he hadn't read the story. He hadn't read the story. He it just, just didn't saw like that. The, the little SH bit. He dot, saw dot, that. Dot. Oh, I'm I'm using a, a f- reference to foul language, and that was enough to upset him. And he didn't want me to write stories like that. And I thought maybe I'm a bad person for doing that. You know, it's that kind of thing. When you're young enough, you you think something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean that that always that's something that I always remembered. Do I pull my punches or do I go for it? And it took me a long time to get to the point where I'm like, no, I go for it. The story has to be true for it to work. You can pull your punches because I've read story, I've read books and stories and stuff where people did pull their punches and they were awful. They're boring. They're so saccharine sweet that you want to just kill yourself rather than read this. They make you give up. You're just like, oh, come on. Is this seriously the best you've got? And, um, yeah, I mean, it was an experience. Obviously, I still remember it 23 years later. So it stuck with me. It was uh, an interesting moment. I don't know. If I immediately thought, geez, I'm tr- my dad's trying to censor me <laughs> or what. But when you talk about who reads your stories, who might read your stories, I had a similar experience with my wife. She likes to read. She doesn't like to listen to audiobooks at all. But she likes to read a lot. And... When I first started writing stuff, uh, first seriously started writing stuff, I would show her my stories and ask her to read them and want her opinion from it. Um, Unfortunately, the kind of story that I write is not the kind of story that she likes to read. Or maybe that's fortunate, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I've had similar reactions from my sister, too, where I've given her stories of mine to read, and she reads them, and she's just like, ah, they're too creepy. I can't take it. I can't read your stories. They're too whatever. But that's not a compliment. It's not, <laughs> your, scary, your story was supposed to be scary, and it sure was. It's, I didn't enjoy reading your story. Well, they didn't enjoy it, but it's not, it, it, was, it was sure was, though. You know what I'm saying? She... There was a time when I tried to get my sister to read Stephen King book, and she couldn't handle those either. Stephen King's books, especially the ones from that time, they're not bad books. He's a good writer. His stories are well done. Sometimes they're less awesome than others, but yeah, and she couldn't handle that either. She's just not a a person that can deal with horror well. And I wouldn't say that my wife can't deal with horror she really disliked the endings that i would tend to put on my stories which everybody dislikes the endings i put on my stories they're always unhappy but there was a time where she made comments about a story that i was in process of writing and it totally derailed me and that i think was when i decided i really need to not show her anything until i have finished writing it Later, I wrote a story, and she basically made a similar comment to my dad, where she's just like, oh, I don't think your pe- the people in your story should be like this. I think they should be nicer people, was basically her comment. And I thought, 
but the the character is not that person. I can't. I, I'm I'm writing about real people. I can't make them all. I'm not writing stories for YA or whatever it is that's younger than YA. I want to say it's middle, middle grade. grade. I'm not writing those. I'm writing a story about a guy who found a revenge crystal. And he used this crystal to take revenge on people, and it killed people, and it was bad. This is not a story for children. It's for adults. And it's a weird thing, because my wife would read stories. She reads all sorts of... Murder mysteries. Murder mysteries. James Patterson, where the, the characters are just awful. And even the good guys, they're not perfect. They do bad things. They do wrong things. And because somebody else wrote them she was fine with that and she'll read it and read it and read it and love it mm -hmm. but when i write it it has to be to some completely different standard which was really upsetting to me i have to admit that was when i thought you know what it's a good thing that she doesn't like to read my stories and i probably need to just not show them to her because she doesn't she doesn't like them they're not the kind of story that she wants to read so you know, making her read them is not making her happy. And then on top of it, what she's going to say about it is going to make me unhappy. So I just need to not do that. My first reader needs to be somebody else. And so, yeah, I don't show her my stories anymore. And I'm kind of glad that she's not interested in them. Just as I'm kind of glad she's not interested in the podcast. There may come a day when she decides she does want to read them again. And I don't know... You'll be dead, remember? Same way as <laughs> yeah. your son. Yeah, maybe that'll be why. That If she does before then, then yeah, I might have some interesting questions to answer. I don't know. We'll have to see. But yeah, it's, it's a really hard thing to be an artist and to deal with other people's opinions of you because of that. Because of decisions you made with your art. If you're an actor, what roles you chose to to take and when you're an actor you just take what you can get really because you're desperate for money because actors they don't work all that much you know they get a job and then they often are jobless for months and months on end i want to say it was tootsie was the movie where you were playing a tomato dustin hoffman goes to a party or something like that with a bunch of other actors and they say uh yeah you know it's what acting is all about being unemployed <laughs> you know and you, you do what you can you make the best art you can and you have to do what you have to do to make it work you have to really play the part to be real about it you can't hold back i'm sure there are lots of actors out there I would prefer not to say some of the things that they say or not to do some of the things that they do, but they're playing a character. They're not being themselves. Basically, they're not saying it. The character is saying it, and they have to do it. And it's the same way with, with a story writer. You know, you write a story, you have to be true. Sometimes a story wants to go a certain direction, and yours almost always do. <laughs> There has to have been a time where you're like, no, I want them all to live happily ever after because, uh, you know, I am I have a kid or I, you know, whatever it is. Or your natural tendency is just like, well, hey, good wins in the end. But the story wanted to go in a place where it wanted to go. It, it, good did not triumph over evil. I don't know. I, just yesterday I was watching an interview with an actor and I don't know if it matters who the actor was. But she said, I will not play a truly evil person. And, you know, I didn't even blink. I didn't care. I was just like, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. But, wow, what actor can just say that? Make this blanket statement and they have enough money to say, oh, you know, I, I, I will not play that part. If somebody offered me that job, I could turn it down or whatever. It's like, you go where the money is. Yeah. You take whatever role is given you. And, and and it is similar, I think, in a way, you know, that, that there may be, you know, super religious folk who are actors that are given a you're a rapist or you're a racist or you're a whatever thing you don't believe in. That's what you are. And if you're a real actor, you do it. 
And I, I don't know, I feel that way with the writing, definitely. I've been writing, I, I wrote recently that, that Western, the sequel to Birth of a Sidekick, and I had to decide whether or not to use a certain word. I think I even texted you at the time, and I was like, wow, shoot, there's a character, and I, I know that in, you know, the 1800s, at least in the era when this story is set, this word would get used. But in the 21st century, we don't use this word. And that's, that's the whole thing. It's like, well, do you write the story true or do you pull your punches? And I, I don't know. That, that, that's a line I guess you have to decide. But with the podcasting thing, do I podcast true? Am I myself 100%? The weird thing is just today, you know, that same podcast I was telling you about where I started to tell an intimate story of myself, I talked about Big once let his wife read a work in progress. <laughs> I, just the, today the story, on my huh? show, I told my point of view of that story. And my point of view was Big wrote about a character who was a little bit like me. And Big's wife said... This character is friggin' pathetic. <laughs> Why would anybody want to read about a loser like this? Now, they, those may not be word for word, <laughs> but that is a very close approximation to what she said. Now, of course, that's my point of view because I know that the character, you know, was, was a loser. And what I was likening it to was how much of myself do I let come through on a podcast? How intimate can I be? How much can I show of who I truly am and have the mask come off kind of thing? Because there's some ugly stuff or there's some embarrassing stuff or that, you know, we're talking about boners again. And I just, <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, sometimes people do ugly things or they say ugly things or they make mistakes. And, you know, when we were talking about Daredevil, we were talking about violence on that show has consequences. And a lot of times in entertainment, there's no consequences. Yeah. But, you know, people do things and lots of times they're bad things. And sometimes they don't even know that they're bad or whatever. But it's a human condition. Everybody should be able to relate to that sort of thing. And if you can't relate to it, then you should be reading children's fiction. And I think if you're writing stories for children, you know, good can always triumph. And, yeah. and you can always pull your punches and you can yeah. always say, you know, you don't the, use the, the, language the man and use. the woman liked each other very much. So one day they held hands, you know, or whatever it is. And they lived happily ever after. And that's all they ever did was hold hands. Gosh, I hate that kind of crap. But I'm not the audience. I'm not the target audience. You know, if, if you're writing for a kid, I, that's fine. That's cool. Anyhow, these are lines that you have to decide whether you're going to cross and all that. And I don't really have a, f a first reader, you know. You would say, okay, well, maybe my wife shouldn't be my first reader. I mean, it would be neat if there was somebody that I gave everything to and I couldn't wait to find out what they thought. And if they liked it, then that meant it was a successful story, which I guess is sort of going along with what we're talking about. <laughs> but yeah, there were times when... You know, I knew so-and-so was going to read it. And so I was like, well, I sort of wanted the character to do this. But now, I'm, now he's not going to do that. And I think that goes hand in hand with, you know, you sharing with your wife or your dad saying you didn't want you to write stories like that. It affects the story that you tell. And maybe the story is better if he doesn't do that thing that you were originally going to have him do. But we wanted it to be a truer story. We wanted it to be the story that it wanted to be. What are the Ellison's laws? Can you give me Harlan Ellison's laws? Harlan Ellison just adapted them, and they're actually Heinlein's laws. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. What are yeah, they? Yeah, uh, he has five, I want to say they are, laws, where basically rule number one, law number one, you must write. Okay. And sometimes that's the hardest rule there. That yeah, is. seriously. The hardest one to uh, achieve. Rule number two, you must, you must finish, finish what, what you, you write. write. So you start something, you finish it. That That's a hard sucker sometimes. Uh, rule number three, you do not rewrite. Unless to uh, editorial. an editorial request. And Harlan Ellison, this is where he added... Only if you agree with that editorial request. 
You don't just bend over and take it because he's an editor. You have to see that, okay, this request is actually going to make it better. What Number you, four oh, okay. was you must submit what you write for publication. And then number five was you must keep that circulating until it is sold. You do not, you know, get one rejection and then say, oh, okay, I'm done. Basically, and this is, that's a really interesting thing. You have this inner voice. Dean Wesley Smith wrote about these laws just very recently. He talks a lot about two voices that you have. You have your critical voice and your creative voice. Your creative voice is where you go to get your stories and what you use when you're writing. And then you have your critical voice, which is what it sounds like. I mean, it's critical. It's it's like a critic. It's saying, oh, this is no good or that is no good. And your critical voice will try to keep you from writing. Basically, your critical voice is there to make things safe for you. You'll never get made fun of. You'll never run into problems if you don't write. Because, you you know, there's nothing for anyone to judge. And your critical voice will try and get you to not finish what you're... It'll get you to stop. You'll be writing and then it'll say, this is no good. You should really just quit. This is, this is not what you want. You, should, you need to stop. You don't rewrite because your critical voice, when you're done, will say, you know what, this is not good. You need to, you need to give it another pass because it, it, there's probably some things that need to be fixed. Your critical voice will try and keep you from getting it out there so that someone can make fun of it. Someone can write you a bad review or something. So it'll try and keep you from sending your stories out. And your critical voice will also try and get you to quit after you get one rejection or two or three because it'll say, oh, oh, it must be no good. You don't need to put it out there anymore and risk more rejection. So basically, it's a way to beat the voices that will tell you to quit. That was the post I I was saying I wanted you to read. I I meant to show to you because I, I struggle with a lot of those issues and I think you struggle with some of them as well. I think we struggle with different ones. Yeah, my critical voice is the one that gets all the boners. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, my critical voice is, yeah, like an opera singer. And then my uh, creative voice, I guess he's much more of like the stammering, uh, uh, soft-spoken guy who... Uh, Jeff Goldblum he's, type. He's, <laughs> running and uh, uh, screaming. Ooh. Yeah, it would be neat if if it were the opposite, you know, if my creative voice were all muscular and pushing me around. But, you know, I, again, that's why we're podcasting. That's why we're trying. It's, you know, we're trying to psych ourselves up. We're trying to say we're going to do something and hope that people hold us accountable for it, even if it's just the two of us reminding us and holding us accountable for it. And I'm sure that there are people much more eloquent than us that have talked about being true writing things that are true, writing the... Tr- what, what is it I'm trying to say? I'm trying to come up with a title for this podcast. But you know what I mean? Just like true, letting the story be lies. what it is <laughs> and not fencing it in and saying, no, no, somebody might get upset or, you know, Aunt Gladys again. Yeah. And I, yeah, I would like to read one of those. If only to say, oh, okay, okay, so it's okay if I do this, you know. I'm a big believer in intent. And, you know, I guess we have pissed a lot of people off in the things that we've done on our podcast or whatever. But I, I don't think that we intended to. We intend to make people laugh or make people interested, make people keep listening, make people write, go out and be creative and achieve their goals and remember that their mountain is waiting. And it's just like there's a lot of things positive that we want people to get out of our show it's not just complaining about stuff. But if there's something we're upset about, we're going to complain about it. And it makes you feel better. <laughs> it makes you feel good. I, I, you know, I, yeah. I, this is free therapy, really, this podcast. And uh, that's all I've got to say about that. Yeah, it's, it's nice to be able to do a podcast. It's nice to be able to put things out there. It's really nice 
to hear back from listeners who say that they found what we talked about to be interesting, to be worthwhile, to be something they wanted to talk about as well, to put in their two cents in the comments or whatever. That's really cool to know that there's somebody out there and there's somebody listening. You know, the other day somebody linked to a blog post on Facebook. And I went to this blog post. You know, people link to blog posts on Facebook all the time. Basically, three out of four posts are links to blogs, it seems. And so I clicked on it, not thinking it was any different than anything else, but sort of interested. I went to it. It was a blog post about a woman who had lost a lot of weight and she was talking about what it's like she was talking about you know the before and after thing and she was basically to the after point now and I thought this is really interesting and I went back to the start of her blog she'd started it several years ago and I started reading her posts from the beginning up to the present I didn't even finish the one that was actually it was actually linked to Instead, I wanted to hear about her whole journey from becoming... Because I'm kind of in that same journey. And she had a lot of really interesting stuff to say. And then finally, I got to that same post that had been linked to. This The whole time as I was going through, there'd be a post. And it would say, oh, there are three comments. And it'd go, oh, there's six comments or whatever. And then I got to the post that had been linked to. And it said there was 1,013 comments. And I went, whoa, it's weird. And and she had very few posts. When she started her blog, she had maybe four posts a month. She did that for three months. And then it went down to like one post a month. And then it quickly went to like one post every six months or so. So I read through her entire blog in the space of a day. And then I got to that. And when I started going back to read, that was her last post was the one which she was talking about. Then she had another post after that, which was basically talking about, holy crap, this thing completely blew up. I was not expecting my last post to go viral, (laughs) but somehow it did. And now I've got, instead of, you know, a hundred readers, I now have a million readers or something, whatever it was that she wound up with. But yeah, her post was all about, her, her blog itself was called, Can Anybody Hear Me? was the name of it. And that's what she finished that post with. You know, she talked about how she may be in the after stage, but she's still that same person, that same person that weighed a hundred pounds more than she does now. People say, oh, you look better now, but she's still that same person. She just looks different. That same person that was there before is still here after. And, um, You know, she still has issues with food and still has problems. And people, they don't see those anymore because she looks like a perfect, thin, you know, person that she's supposed to be. And uh, she's just wondering if anybody can actually see who she really is. And then suddenly, bam, there's a thousand comments from people. So... It's kind of therapy, like that basically was what she was doing, was she was putting out, I have this issue, and I'm trying to work through it. And she would talk about each little thing as she went. Oh, I had this setback. And she would talk about, you know, even if you gain five pounds, you know, you haven't failed. You tried, you worked on it, you did something. Even if you lost this weight and then gained it all back. You haven't failed. Just putting in the effort is worth something. You know, that's always my trouble is writing. You have to write rule number one. You know, I write some and then I stop and I don't write for a month or more. That doesn't mean that I've failed. It's like the comment. I have uh, my other podcast and uh, there's uh, a bunch of inspirational quotes. And one of the quotes is today is the first day. It's day one. This is where we make the future. You know, that's the way it is always. Every day is day one. You can start over any time. You can turn it around any time. And you take all the experience that you have from before and just add to it. Uh, it, This is definitely therapy. And it's definitely making a support system. 
you talked about having first readers. I put a post out on Facebook asking if anybody would like to be my first reader. And I got a bunch of volunteers that said, yeah, I'll do that. I sent out a couple stories to these people. A few of them I've already heard back from. Some of them I still am I'm, I'm waiting to hear what they have to say about my stories. But I sent them my two most recent stories just to see what needs to be done. What typos they have. What logical uh, issues they might have. That kind of stuff. But also what I'm weak at. What I need to improve on. And uh, I wouldn't have these first readers. As I've said, you know, my wife doesn't like to read my stuff. <laughs> my kids are too young to read my stuff. I guess you could be my first reader, but that's probably about all I got. And when it comes down to it, you and I don't have time to read each other's stuff. Or else we won't be writing our own stuff. So it's nice to have somebody that can give me that. And I can only get that because of the podcast. and Because of putting myself out there. And uh, finding that somebody can hear me. I don't know. It's pretty cool. And that's all I got to say. <laughs> all right. We both Forrest Gumped. I guess we will leave people until next week. But, yeah, this is the year we're going to write novels. And uh, it is not a little hill to climb. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know our mountain is waiting and all that stuff. <laughs> but a novel is a big deal. Or at least for me. And maybe once we start writing, I'll be like, you know what? It wasn't a big deal. Holy cow. It was... It was easy. Why have I not been doing this for years? That was, was the only best. one page longer than my last story. <laughs> well, in my case, that may be <laughs> true. But the fact that we're going to do this difficult thing, I, and you know what? If it weren't difficult, then everybody would do it. And maybe you go to Amazon self-publishing, you know, Kindle direct publishing, <laughs> and you discover that everybody does do it. Yeah. But it's not something I've done before. And so uh, I need the encouragement. I need to know... That somebody is listening. Is that what what did the woman say? Can anybody hear me? Can anybody hear me? I need to know that. And I I hope that uh, when, you know, it gets tough and when it gets difficult to continue, and like, oh, shoot, yeah, I'm just going to chalk this up as a bad experience, that I'll know that, the, no, you know, people heard me say I was going to do this, and they're going to hold me to it. And more importantly, I'm going to hold me to it. Gosh, I, I, it would just be really, really cool. To be at the end of that, our equivalent of that woman's blog, and say, you know, I did it. Here is my book. And it's about this, and you can buy it if you'd like over at this link. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> that's just in whatever the near future yeah. that day. But, you know, I, I know that there are going to be obstacles and there are going to be moments when we stumble. And all that, but it just—it's it's what we've decided to do. And so, I, once again, you know, we're uh, we're committed to this, and uh, and we've got an an outlet. We've got a what, whatever this is that we're doing right now. It's uh, a forum, and uh, yeah, we like to hear that people are listening. Like to hear that people care. And so, I expect a friggin' thousand comments on this episode. <laughs> I, I want it right now. Pause it. We haven't even got to the license agreement. Pause it and put a comment on there. I'm not screwing around. Good luck, Don't make man. me bring California Rish in here to talk about how much better he is than you. <laughs> you just comment right now. I've been Rish Outfield. And I'm Vic Yankovic. Thanks for listening, everybody. Be well. Please, sir, that gets my goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. But you're free to steal it. I was going somewhere with this, and I've completely forgotten. What were we talking about before I started in on this story? I'm going to roll up the windows because I'm getting slightly chilly. I don't know if you're getting chilly, are you? No, my heat keeps me warm. Oh, good. Did you want to finish on some other note? <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs>